Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, I suppose, to everyone, wherever you may be, somewhere across this lovely world of ours. Well, thanks so much for joining us live here today for Serverless Office Hours, streaming and welcoming you on the AWS Twitch channel on YouTube Serverless Land and also via LinkedIn Live. Uh, my name's Julian Wood. I'm a developer advocate for Serverless at AWS. I'm super happy to be joined by the one and only Ryan Coleman. Ryan, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. And um, yeah, you've had a, yeah, tell us, you haven't been at AWS for that long, but I think what we're going to be talking about today means that in real years, it's about a hundred, but all compressed <laughs> in time, uh, into the time you've been here. So how, yeah, how have you landed up at AWS and what do you do for AWS? Yeah. So I, I'm based in uh, lovely Portland, Oregon, uh, raining as it does in winter all through. Uh, I'm in London, I, so it's the same. And many of my colleagues <laughs> yeah. in Seattle. So yeah, there's some there's yeah. some rainy um, correlation with AWS. Yeah, uh, some, definitely some weather siblings. I, so I came out to Portland to join a startup called Puppet. I got to join early days. They're I'm big well, yeah. code for the data yeah. center. So it's, it's a space I've been in for a long time. And then I got to join another Portland startup that focused on serverless in the sort of same category. And now I've kind of landed in AWS to kind of continue that, that passion for how do you make uh, services more accessible to developers and operators. Uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty exciting. I've been here just over a year. So yeah, it's, it's been great. Excellent. So was there a sort of to a particular journey in your mind thinking, you know, going from uh, something like Puppet, which is a, you know, very uh, sort of or infrastructure and application deployment uh, thing, obviously on premises and in the cloud as well, and into the sort of serverless world. I'm just thinking that because my own background, I come from an infrastructure background and, you know, Puppet and Chef and all those things were huge. And when serverless came along, I just sort of could see the future. What was what your sort of connection? How did you make that jump between uh, the ideas, ideas of Puppet and ideas of serverless? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I think Puppet, similar to AWS, very customer obsessed. And I got to access, you know, a ton of great customers who were building, you know, super big applications, all the classic enterprises you think about. And what was really fascinating to me about Puppet, it's an automation framework, if you're unfamiliar, it's really focused on VMs, but can do cloud as well. And it helped people kind of modularize, hey, any service I can now replicate, I can re reliably repeat it and operate it with this automation framework. And when I go into these data centers and I see what people are doing with it, it was really them trying to build managed services for their developers. So ops teams, mix of developers, trying to build out these globally scalable solutions in part on, on Puppet's framework. And yeah. what, what you know, flip around that box around a serverless and you're like, okay, same sort of idea. How do you build a really scalable, you know, scale to zero cost effective solution for any kind of service? Um, but you know, AWS is offering it instead of a team building it and managing it themselves for their own developers. Uh, I find that to be sort of a really interesting parallel, just looking at it from a different angle. Excellent. Well, we are will be joining and getting all the goods from Ryan uh, very shortly. But don't forget, we are live on serverless office hours. So if you have any questions or comments, please send them uh, via the comment section and we will address them uh, during the show. And yeah, tell us where you're from. To, uh, tell us your history of getting into serverless or what, what is of interest. So just quickly looking back over the past week of serverless. Um, last week's stream was super interesting. This was all um, uh, Pallavi with, uh, did a really good show talking about preparing your serverless architectures for the big day and thinking about scaling limits and, and talking about API gateway and Lambda and all things like that. So have a look on the on youtube.com slash serverless land. And that has last week and all the previous episodes of serverless office hours. In terms of uh, what's new for AWS serverless, <clears throat> some things have been carrying on. Uh, the most recent one from Lambda is runtime management controls. Uh, for a small subset of customers who are interested in making sure that Lambda doesn't in the rare occasion, break something. You've got a little bit more uh, in your functions when we do the automatic updating. Obviously, one of the best benefits of serverless is this automatic patching, but you know sometimes that can bite you. So uh, this is some more controls that you can uh, do that. And the second one, I just laugh and like because the fact that Amazon S3 file gateway now supports DOS attributes just brings me back to many, many, many years ago. And I love the thought that's. Uh, somebody out there is using DOS attributes and needed S3 file gateway to support that. So good on you. Uh, some uh, serverless compute blog posts. Um, yeah, the top two, the second one, uh, Apache uh, VTL. Lots of people using Apache VTL. Everybody knows it's not the easiest thing to work with. So some good best practices from Ben and Marcus. And then um, also a nice one from John Ritzema about previewing environments using containerized Lambda functions. So this is using function URLs. And really, in your CD, uh, CD pipeline, you can really quickly spin up these um, Lambda functions with a URL in the front of it that you can get your business people to preview things. And just a super good blog post 
supposed to go through all of that. But that was the last week talking about today, visually design and build serverless applications. Now, we all talk about infrastructure as code, from code, in code, and there's a lot of coding things. Ryan, tell us about this visual element of serverless applications. Yeah, I the approach here is to just help take that sort of idea of how do you build the services and integrate them, which is a really difficult part, and just make that approachable through a drag and drop editor. Um, would you like me to show that off a little bit, Julian? Let's do it, people. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we love to see demos. Um, and I'll be the first one to say that um, maybe AWS historically hasn't necessarily been uh, the, the best guardians of uh, visual workflows and canvases. You know, we've got there are a lot of things going on. Uh, the Step Functions team has certainly stepped that up with their uh, recent workflow studio, and we're about to see some new other cool things. So it's really cool to see how, uh, you know, specifically in the serverless space, uh, the idea of visually building things and putting things together is, uh, is just getting so much better, which I love. So yeah, Ryan, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, yeah, let me get that started. And the Step Functions Workflow Studio, uh, that's that's such a great product and been an inspiration for us as we built this. Yeah. Uh, let me just get the window sharing going here. Yeah, and it's not just about also using these products and services, but it's also sort of the, the really uh, sort of nice discoverability uh, part of it, where you can just discover how things all fit together because you can then see it on the screen. Yeah, and as you kind of mentioned, it's relatively new, this approach uh, in AWS. I, I think, as I mentioned, one of the things that fascinates me about serverless is how quickly you can get really robust applications built on really great services. So to me, it's kind of like closing this last mile of how do you make that sort of awesome power of these services more accessible to more developers who yeah. are very limited on time, right? It's not about um, the skill. It just takes time to learn these kinds of things. So yeah, uh, yeah let me show you how Composer can fit into that. And I think even from a visual perspective, I'm sure I saw something today from uh, the, the AWS networking team where on the whole VPC construct, when you're building VPCs, that that's got a whole visual way that you can now visualize the VPCs with the associated subnets and I think the security groups as well. So yeah, there we go. You know, More visual stuff for the win. Yeah, there's a lot of that coming out, and that's a great example. Um, you can tell us all about it if you want, all the stuff coming out. I'm sure people will want to know. <laughs> yeah. I am, uh, I'm, I'm in jest, but there will be more. <laughs> yeah, uh, now we'll get to that. Uh, so for now, I'm, I'm going to skip through this and I'll show you how you can work with existing applications in a moment. But I kind of just want to show you the core of what this is. If you're new to Application Composer and this sort of visual approach, I'm, I, I should have mentioned on this homepage here, we're a preview. Uh, we launched at reInvent. Uh, you can tell us anything you want here on the stream. I'm happy to field your questions, of course. And then later on, you can submit feedback throughout the app. Um, our team reads everyone, so please don't shy away from sharing your thoughts. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can load an existing project. I'm just going to show just you. Ryan, for, the from the preview, are there specific things you're looking to get feedback from the preview? I mean, obviously, yeah. this is a new thing. You know, people are going to be trying it out. But yeah, are there very specific things you, you would like? Um, you would like? Yeah. To well. Um, so there, I guess I would say there's three categories. One is sort of the, the usability of this app. We're trying to make this sort of simple and intuitive to use. It's, you know, part of the preview is kind of sorting out which of our choices were intuitive to you, which weren't. So offering us feedback on what you struggled to accomplish that you thought should have been simpler. That's on us. Just highlight that for us. And that really, that feedback really helps us improve the app. Another is resource support. So for example, one of the common requests we get is for Fargate. So you can type into this search bar, yeah. you can click the feedback form here. So help us understand which services do you wanna build? And then the other bit that we'll get into later in the demo is um, sometimes it's not just about, hey, how do I define a given service? It's how do I make this AWS service work well with this AWS service? And so offering us feedback on where you really have complex challenges integrating services, that's an area where we really try to focus. Okay, thanks. I, so to demonstrate that, let me try the classic, the S3 bucket. So as you can see, I can select from these resources. Again, this is a preview selection. Tell us what you'd like us to add next. We're going to expand this over time. Um, we have a properties panel here uh, for graphically sort of configuring certain aspects. This product is not trying to give you sort of the raw cloud formation schema for every resource you can manage in AWS. It's trying to give you sort of a curated view of these are the common things you might want to change, the logical ID or name of the bucket, public access, static hosting, that kind of stuff. Uh, underneath, we're managing the infrastructure's code template. 
This happens to be CloudFormation. It can also support AWS SAM, the serverless application model. Uh, we can talk later. Please tell me which frameworks you use and, and what you love about them. We're happy to consider other requests. This isn't uh, necessarily scoped to CloudFormation. But today we're, we're building in default configurations. You may come in and tweak these settings, uh, but by default, you're gonna get encryption for this bucket. You're gonna get a bucket policy for that encryption and you're gonna get public access turned off by default. If you flip this checkbox and hit save, you'll see that that gets removed immediately. Right? So these kinds of things um, are, are back and forth. You can kind of make changes in the editor, you can make changes in the template and I'll show you more on that in a moment. So the console is the visual editor is basically building CloudFormation uh, on the back end, and there's a direct sync between the two. And then obviously you can go and yeah, tweak to your heart's content. Exactly. And as you saw with this public access, it tries to be very surgical about that. So I'll just do that again. Um, this product's capable of reading at this sort of property and key value layer uh, what configuration you have in an existing template. And so we can provide this checkbox on any existing template that has this configuration. Okay. And if I turn that off, it surgically removes that. So this is not exclusive to things you build with Composer. It, it yeah. works this way for all the resources that Composer supports. Uh, let me just put that back on. I never like to leave public access on. Yeah. Uh, there's other things in here. For instance, you can bring in an event bridge uh, event rule. Uh, and you can see that that one has a very basic sort of source event pattern that you'd obviously want to customize to your needs. Um, but I want to show off this sort of integration concept. So as you visually drag these lines, you can create connections between them. In this case, you can't yet create an event rule to a bucket. However, you can create an event rule from a bucket to a function. So if I drag these, you can see how these sort of ports suggests to you what you can connect to. Uh, we try to support most of what these services are capable of underneath the hood, uh, and you'll see that in this UI. But the important bit, and let me just make this template smaller, is that as you do that, not only are you getting a function that has its default setup, but this events uh, property here has been filled in. Again, these are sort of saying defaults. You may customize or filter the events that are, that are triggering the invocation of this function but you're gonna get that sort of built out by default. Similarly, the function has this editor, this has many more settings that you can tweak and turning, uh, including turning on the functions URL feature, um, but that's all available here. Uh, and then one of the cool bits of this, I can disconnect this line. And as I said before, it's very surgical. So that events property is missing now. And I can flip this around because I might say, okay, I actually, what I wanted to do is be able to read and write to this bucket. Um, so these lines, you're starting to get a sense, represent sort of three categories of things. And I'm going to show you the other two. So I can pass in environment data. So by connecting the function to the bucket, I have these variables, bucket name, bucket arm passed in. So I can use that within my Lambda function. And I have IAM policies. In this case, this is provided via a SAM policy template. Composer supports SAM policy templates. It does some custom IAM in certain cases. Uh, it tries to give you at least resource scope by default and tries to minimize the privileges expressed. In this case, this is a CRUD policy because it assumes you want to read and write to the bucket. So if you only needed to read, you'd want to go and customize uh, the permissions provided to this function, which you can do in the visual editor here just by specifying an alternative uh, SAM policy template. Ryan, um, Dan's just asked a question. Can you paste in an existing SAM template to start from? I presume that's yes. yes. Yeah, you absolutely can. Uh, let me, I haven't practiced this, but let me go to serverlessland.com and try exactly that. And in fact, what's best about the show is when uh, other people help each other out and add long will, yes, you can. Well, thank you very much. So um, uh, yeah, love it when our community help each other despite what we're talking about. Yeah. Absolutely. So let me um, try something simple here, just so that we don't have a giant template. Uh, again, I, I don't know if this is going to work. Most templates will work out of the box. Um, comments will not be preserved, one caveat. This tool is intended to sort of start automating the IAC management for you. It's going to try to respect all of your CloudFormation code comments. It's not as respectful of. Um, but there you go. So it interprets those changes. And now I have the simple serverless LAN pattern of a Lambda S3. You can imagine how that extends to your existing templates or some of these other patterns. Um, in fact, if I go in and load, uh, I'll just go ahead and open a much bigger template. Uh, you're going to miss, I think, on this stream, you're going to miss the file system browsers. Um, what I'm doing now is selecting uh, a GitHub repo 
that I've checked out. I'm choosing the AWS serverless airline booking sample. Oh, and I've selected the wrong folder in it. Give me one moment. Okay, and I'm choosing a template here. So what I've done here is just go out and choose that GitHub project that I cloned, the, the airline booking. I've selected a folder that has a template in it. This one has one I could have selected from multiple. And I'm authorizing my browser to view this. I'm, so a couple important points to cover here. One, you of course, you can support existing templates. Two, this is a browser-only tool. I didn't say that at the top. I'm using a uh, read-only IAM role to do this demo. I, there is no data being stored in your AWS account. This is being served to you out of the AWS management console into your browser, and then it's exclusively working there. In a few moments, I'll show you how that connects to your local file system. Um, that's sort of hinted here at this connected mode. In this case, if I were to make any changes to this sample that I have checked out on my local file system, those changes will be immediately reflected here. So that is a distinction. You're not, you're not quite building a live AWS application in the console. This is for best practices for infrastructure as code. And in fact, you are using the console to build your local ISE file. Yeah. Exactly. I think of it more as a designer for getting yeah. that sort of architecture built out. It's connected to your file system so you can go through that next loop. Maybe it's provisioning a stack for development purposes. Maybe it's iterating on your Lambda functions. I'm, it's meant to, to be a tight development loop, but the product itself is not trying to own resources in your account. It's trying to help you define them in your infrastructure as code. Are there any sort of browser requirements? I. So we support all browsers, but with different capabilities. Okay. So in Chrome and Edge, you get this full connected experience where it's bi-directional automatically on both sides. Um, that's based on um, an open API called the File System Access API. Uh, so behind the scenes, we're just using a standard browser API to do that. Chrome and Edge fully support it. Safari and uh, Firefox do not support that API yet. Uh, but in those modes, you can bring a template in, you can get a template out. It's just not as full featured. The other benefit of using Chrome or Edge uh, is we'll scaffold these functions for you. We're not writing the code for you, but we scaffold them so that it's a deployable handler that you know, you know accepts an event uh, and then processes that. Uh, so you can kind of get going with a Lambda function on your file system without having to kind of create the file, create the handler. It's kind of similar to running a SAM init uh, for your functions. One other distinction on the existing template support to call out this read-only resource thing happening. Because I mentioned earlier, we have a subset of resources we support. We've done the work to express what is the default configuration? What can this resource connect to? What happens in the infrastructure as code template when you connect multiple resources together? All the permutations of those connections, all the combinations. For resources that we haven't done that work yet to support, we can read them and we represent them, and we try to understand their connections to other resources based on the CloudFormation syntax like references. All right. So in this case, I have a state execution role, looks like an IAM role. I probably have a state machine in here. Yep, looks like there's my AWS step function state machine. Today, we support the SAM abstraction for state machines, but you could expect better state machine support later this year. Uh, and it's trying to give you sort of a summary of how did we interpret this part of the template to produce this box that's connected to these things, right? So you can bring in any template. Some resources are going to be read-only. Uh, Chromium browser is uh, any Chromium-based browser, uh, to the chat question. Yeah, any Chromium-based browser, primarily that's sort of Google Chrome and Microsoft Edge in the sort of name brand. But any Chromium-based browser that supports that API should work. Um, of course, a Chromium implementation can choose to exclude this API, yeah. which I believe Brave does, by the way. Okay. Thanks for joining us, Zach Jones Dewell. Hello from India. Always nice to have you via Twitch. <clears throat> OK, so to um, make this sort of connection point, let me um, move out uh, back to the home page. And I'm going to open up. I'm going to switch my screen share here. This is going to be much bigger uh, or maybe harder to read. But I want to, sh to show you that connection a little bit more. Okay, let me add that in. <clears throat> Thank you, Julian. OK, so I am don't focus too much on the detail here. I'm trying to show you the workflow. Uh, and I'll try to zoom this in a little bit as I notice it. it's not super big. Um, but the idea here, let's just go into this demo mode. I've got on my laptop this office hours folder. There's nothing in it. 
I'm going to select that folder from Composer. I'm, that browser uh, API that I mentioned, it's going to ask you two prompts. Can you authorize this browser client to view the files? Yes. Once you do that, it's going to ask, can it write to that folder, which in this case, Composer needs write uh, access yep. in order to do its work. Once I've done that, you'll see it's starting to populate in. This, this is a demo mode where we're actually creating fully featured uh, functions. So this is not the scaffolding you'll expect in the normal workflow. This is a complete working app, um, sort of a complete sample that you might expect to get from serverless land and AWS samples, just kind of embedded in the app here for demonstration purposes. If I open up the template, and then let me just check to see how small we're getting here. I'm, the idea that I really want to demonstrate here is that we've got this API gateway, serverless API, we're managing this definition body. I want to show you what happens when I go to extend this. And the other thing I want to highlight for you as we go here is this grouping functionality. This is meant to help you organize visually what you're doing. And at the very bottom of my template, uh, it should be big enough to read here, I've got this metadata key. This is standard CloudFormation metadata that Composer is using to encode group membership. So There's this is a specific this... resource that Composer is using to be able to group things. And that's only applicable on the visual side. It's not going to obviously have anything when you deploy it, but it just uh, allows you to group it. That's absolutely right. It's not an AWS resource group. It's here mainly to help you. As uh, you can imagine, as you scale out and you start having a much larger architecture that fills this canvas, it becomes a little bit harder to understand yeah. what's going on. Group is one aspect of how we help you organize visually. Uh, and then we're working on features that'll help you sort of see different granularity of information as you zoom out. Today, it's all sort of one, but you can imagine as we start to zoom out on a group, we're gonna help show you less detail so you can get a, at a glance view of what's in that group and start to really have a much uh, more complex architecture on the canvas. Uh, but yes, as Julian's mentioned, this is just references of these logical IDs. I could edit this by hand and add in a new one and it'll work. Um, but just to show you kind of how this product behaves, I go in and add a Lambda function. I should have had my Explorer view because this function you can see here is being scaffolded. This is what you can expect day to day as you kind of work in Composer. It's just trying to get this going for you because one of the core tenets of this product is that in almost every situation, what you do on this canvas is deployment ready. So you can take this template out. You can take this handler function out and deploy it. Then you can start developing your own logic against it, extending it, doing what you wish. Um, but the goal of this product is to get you to a deployable state as quickly as possible. There's a few exceptions to that. Um, if I go to edit this API gateway route, I have obviously these routes from the demo. Let me add one here for let's say um, get users. If I save this, I've added a route. Now, if I go back to this template, Again, this is working on my file system. If you've just joined, this is a connection between the browser client and the file system. And if I go up here, I have my users method. If I try to deploy it in this state, CloudFormation is going to tell me that I don't have anything connected uh, to this route. It's going to fail on sort of this integration missing. Uh, so if I just connect these lines, you're going to see that get filled in. Right? So in this case, an integration to a Lambda function, and it's filling in the reference to that function R. If I change the name of this function, let's call this get users, perhaps. I'm going to see it update the reference to get users. Cool. Right. So even if you bring in a template um, that, that is your own, that you started with from, from another tool, Composer is trying to understand your template at a very detailed level and maintain these references throughout so that you can do something like this, where visually you're creating an API route, connecting it to a function, adding it to a group. And you can come in and make hand edits. There's going to be a lot of cases like the one with the S3 bucket earlier where you might want to customize the filters. We don't have a capability in the browser yet to help you with event filters. You can come in and modify this, this template. Composer is going to respect that. It's going to continue to maintain the things that it owns, like the name here. And if you change the name in the template, it's going to try to read that and correct itself and its understanding. So um, think of it as this sort of bi-directional loop between these two things. Uh, another thing we can do in terms of direct service integrations, this is an area that we'll be expanding. And I'm curious for your feedback. Um, we want to be able to let you 
do more with AWS services without having a Lambda function acting as an intermediary. Many services today can be integrated directly with API Gateway. This is not something Composer's uh, introducing, um, but we're trying to make that simpler. And let me just say invoke on this route. I have a state machine here. I'm, Julian at the top mentioned Step Functions Workflow Studio is another product here that, that goes really far into helping you visually design a workflow using Step Functions. This is not trying to replace that. In fact, we consider them a sibling team that we very much want these to be complementary experiences. So you can think of this side of the, the glass as helping you connect your state machine to the services that you need to provision and maintain for your application. So this is just a reference to that. You could paste in your ASL here and we'll attempt to parse it and present these ports where you can connect um, resources. Say for instance, a function that I want to invoke as part of my workflow. You can do things like this. Over time, we'll make that a more connected experience. Today, it's sort of here, but you have to bring in your state machine. Yeah. But the point I want to make here, if I go back up to my API, I have my invoke route here. There's elements of this that are, that are pretty hard. If you've done it a bunch of times, it's probably old hat for you. But just this expression of I want to invoke a state machine when I post to this route, and perhaps you have some other details you want to express. But just this simple expression, you can see how big this open API definition became. Right? I need credentials, which Composer is managing for you. It's, it's filled in uh, this arm to a role that it can use to assume to invoke the state machine. It's created all the sort of necessary bits about your method and your URI. In this case, it knows how to connect to the start execution uh, API gateway URI. And the request template passing in sort of the basics. You can, this is probably the bit you would customize most to your application needs, because maybe you need to you know, customize how you invoke that state machine. But by default, you're going to get there's you know the state machine R and pass through, which is kind of the, the minimum bit you need to, to invoke this state machine. So that's one of the direct service integrations that are capable today. The one you can design with Composer. We're looking at um, being able to send and receive messages from a queue via API, which is supported today in API Gateway, but not yet supported in Composer. Similarly with DynamoDB, S3, um, so I'm curious um, in the chat or, or, or later uh, by hitting the feedback form here, if you just hit this button, you can tell us as you think about it later, oh, I'd really like to be able to connect X to Y. You can just tell us here. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Okay, so that's core loop here. Let me bounce out. Well, actually, I'll show you one more thing before I leave this full screen mode. I'm going to open another project. Yeah, just while we were looking at <coughs> Zach Jones, well, yeah, um, <coughs> one of the challenges with the stream is a lot of information on the screen to be able to read everything. So uh, API Gateway Direct Service Integrations with VTL Resolvers. Is it the same with App Composer? Sorry, I couldn't see the screen clearly. Understandable. Yeah, totally understandable. So this won't help you with VTL. Um, that's something that we're kind of interested in looking at. It's doing the sort of minimum bit to kind of connect the API to invoke the state machine. Um, as we look at Dynamo, I think that becomes more relevant because you start to pass in um, more yeah. custom behavior. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's not something that Composer is going to help you with today, but it's kind of on our radar. Uh, and yeah, I'm sorry about the screen legibility here. I'm trying to show you the relationship between yeah. these two, and I understand that it's it's a bit small. I'm going to show you one more thing here, and then we'll move on. I'm, so this is a similar thing that you just saw me build out in real time. This is just cooking show here. Let me switch to the cooking show screen. I'm Really, the only point of this is that in the background, I've run this command SAM sync. SAM is the serverless application model. This is a separate CLI. This is not part of Application Composer. This CLI is meant to kind of complete this workflow. So if Composer is helping you design the application architecture, SAM is about helping you then develop and iterate on that architecture and build the application logic um, that you, you have here working with all these services. SAM Sync in particular is a cool feature that I like to show off in comparison to this because it will, especially with this watch flag, it will monitor your template and your Lambda function code, look for updates to both based on when you save the file or so on. And then initiates, in this case, a CloudFormation deployment. 
So in this case, I'm just going to clear the screen here so you can see this work in real time. Just I'm trying to, you know, I guess beat you over the head with this point that I can add in a resource like an S3 bucket that will be immediately noticed because Composer wrote to the template and Sam Sync picks this up. So you may, you know, do a more deliberate action, for instance, in the AWS toolkit, um, there's a feature now where you can go in here and sync your SAM application. I know it's a bit small. One of the menu items here uh, is being able to just trigger a sync through the GUI instead of having the CLI process running in your, in your shell. Um, that's totally an option, same idea. Um, I just kind of like the cleverness of as I'm working here, I can drag in a function, I can connect that function to the bucket and sort of in the background, this process is taking care of making my AWS count uh, true to the diagram. Uh, so, I'll leave that you is with awesome. That. I actually, I actually hadn't thought of how slick that integration was because uh, that other functionality. There's a sort of uh, a family of things I, th I suppose Sam could do under a banner of called Sam Accelerate to accelerate your local development. And basically, each time you save that local infrastructure as code tool, which previously you were then typing out, uh, that would then save it. Uh, that would uh, build a stack and then and then just send the update. So for a Lambda function, for example, or API Gateway, it's actually talking just to the Lambda or API Gateway um, API. It's not actually doing a whole cloud formation, which means it's super quick. Now with this, yeah, you're just visually doing it. That uh, the drop dropping on the canvas initiates that automatic save, which is then just going to up update that template. And uh, yeah, this is phenomenal because Sam accelerates really for fast local iteration, but using cloud services. If you're able to deploy in the cloud, you're able to test things in the cloud, including IAM permissions and all that connectivity, rather than sort of futzing around and trying to do everything locally and makes it really quickly. So you get the best, best of both worlds, this local uh, deployment uh, and development, and then syncing, syncing up to the cloud. Yeah, and it's awesome to see how it integrates visually. That is cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, this is one of those things where the CloudFormation loop does take a little while. And so by the time you think to go and trigger it, now you're waiting for that whole loop. What I think is really magical about this combination is that that loop starts to become invisible to you, at least as you're sort of tinkering, maybe you go and add a group, like this will continue to catch up with you. And right now it's adding the function that I added just after it started the bucket sync. I'm, and it, it's pretty effective. I, some caveats mm -hmm. apply to this sort of automatic watch mode. As you saw earlier, if I add a new route here, it's going to update the template with the sort of scaffolding for that route, but it's not yet legal CloudFormation template that can be deployed. So in that case, the watch process will break. We're kind of talking with the SAM team about uh, what, what can we do over time to make that sort of cleaner? What can Composer do to kind of make those things more deployment ready from Go? Um, so there's a lot of work there to make that even more seamless, but I like how smooth this can be for yeah. most situations. And also I the other big caveat is the sort of syncing is really only for development environments. Uh, you can imagine you are dragging a, uh, in your production environment, you don't want somebody inadvertently dragging a Lambda function onto the canvas and that being deployed to the cloud. So really excellent for development. Uh, it's going to allow you to create those infrastructures called code templates, which then ideally you can put through your, um, put through your pipelines and send into product. Yes, a thousand percent plus one on that. This is for development. Sam Sync is, it will tell you, in fact, when you invoke it, this is for development only because yeah. uh, it's, yeah, it's provisioning stuff. Maybe it's the stuff you're going to go on to ship to production. And that's uh, similarly why you see Composer not making direct API calls to provision and update your resources because that's not what it's for. It's yeah. trying to help you connect to a fast loop that Sam can provide so that those services can be provisioned for your development needs but it's not trying to maintain resources in your account. It's trying to help you design an architecture. You can quickly spin that up with Sam or any other tool you have for doing that uh, and, and move on and start iterating. And so now that I have this up, I'm gonna kind of, I actually have the chat up so I can see any questions you have. Please um, keep asking them and I'm gonna well, the, see if I missed. There was one from Blue Valhalla. Thanks for joining us via Twitch. Yeah, just, uh, you know, is there any integration? Well, I suppose not integration, but the actual uh, Amplify, Amplify Studio and App Composer to look at the back end. Yeah. I'm, so there's three categories of this that we're looking at now. I'm, and it all comes down to, at least today, for CloudFormation support, there's a lot of products like Amplify um, and CDK, frankly, that kind of resolve down to a CloudFormation view. And in those cases, we're working on how do we understand the sort of upstream metadata in the CDK case or Amplify Studio case to give you a visualization that's contextual to what you were doing in Amplify Studio, to your, to your question. So that's not something that's in the product today. But it's something we're definitely looking at because yeah. this is this product today supports SAM and CloudFormation. It's meant to help you visualize your architecture. So however you built that, 
whichever IAC framework you've built, whichever upstream sort of abstraction framework like CDK or Amplify Studio, that's great. Keep using those tools. Composer is going to catch up to you and help you um, visualize or modify what you build in those tools. Uh, today is not yet supported. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and just the other question. Hey, Cloud Sofa, nice to have you with us again from via YouTube. Can I model nested SAM templates? Output of mm -hmm. one template becomes the input for another template. Another sort of preview caveat, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this does not yet support nested or even multiple stacks. Um, but you can imagine, so the design here, um, you can scale out quite a bit. We've tested this with pretty complex applications. And one of the, the ideas we're kicking around now is how do we help you visualize the boundary that would represent a stack or another repo, um, which had another stack, like stack being specific to CloudFormation, you know, Terraform has a different way of composing multiple manifests that you might compose into an application. We're thinking about how to just generally represent those boundaries and in the cloud formation context, you're absolutely right. Once we understand the boundaries between these, we could add in features like helping you connect the output from one resource to another um, just by wiring up the cloud formation syntax. Can you do that like you do manually today? Cloud formation, or sorry, Composer can definitely help you with that, um, but not yet in this preview. Yeah, and the last just question before we carry on with the demo can we import uh, cloud formation generated by CDK synth into the command also to? <clears throat> You definitely can. As I was mentioning earlier, we don't awesome. understand the metadata yet. So it's not going to give you sort of that richness of here's the sort of construct that yeah. you use to get these underlying resources. That's what we want to add in. But any cloud formation is going to come in here and you'll get decent results for any sort of scale mm -hmm. template with that caveat that some of those resources that we don't yet support in this picker are going to come in as these read-only resources that are that are slightly less useful because you can't edit them and extend them and integrate them. Visually. Yeah, so any, anything created, uh, creating cloud formation, um, we got you covered. Yeah, and Blue of our hello. Yep, thanks. Looking forward to easily visualizing my backend from Amplify and possibly extending it outside Amplify when needed. Exactly. Yeah, can't <laughs> wait to fully support that. I see a shout out for Sam Sink in there. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah that uh, was one I, I, saw. I think it's, yeah, such a, such a great uh, tool on its own right. And then complementary to this, I, I think it's, it's going to really help people get stuff going and as we expand this this picker. Um, but another thing, for, for example, as, as we're kind of getting more questions into the chat, I'm, one of the other things that I, I showed you earlier is how quickly you can add in resources. And for instance, if you were new to SNS and SQS, you could quickly experiment with how does it work to have a Lambda function connected to either? How do I then you know, work with sort of the DLQ <laughs> pattern? Right? These are things that Composer makes pretty accessible. Even if this is not exactly how you would configure your architecture in production, one of the points we're trying to make here is that this should be simpler to kind of get something going and play with an idea. And we're trying to reduce the cost of experimenting on that idea, that cost being understanding the IAC syntax, the cloud formation to express each of these resources, the cloud formation to integrate them. And then once you've done all that, if it's taken you a while to kind of understand this complex syntax, it can be pretty annoying to say, okay, well, I'm going to throw all that away and move on to SNS and try that out. I, yeah. That's that's one of the things this tool really enables for you is just like it, just drag and drop and say, okay, I want to create a subscription to this, hit the arrange button, come back over, and I have this architecture that I could go on and, and provision and try out. Or if I'm using SamSync, it's already there for me um, by the time I take a sip of coffee. I... So resource execution policies in the template. Um, yes, to for most situations, you're going to get an IAM policy. Um, let me refresh out to something a little smaller to show you that to you. Oops, I didn't mean to be in demo mode. So for example, if I do a function and a bucket. Um, so in this case, I get a bucket policy, and this is just a explicit AWS S3 bucket policy uh, that handles the encryption that was set up by default. And you have a function, and this function sort of has its events. When you flip that around, you're going to get the function with its, in this case, a SAM policy template. S3 CRUD policy. You can also find these in the visualization down here. 
and you can you know swap this out for a policy of your choice. In fact, you can just swap out this name, assuming that it also takes bucket name as a, as a property, which most SAM policy templates relating to S3 do. I, so in that case, you're getting sort of the resource policy. Now, your execution role for this Lambda function, that's buried in this abstraction, this AWS serverless function. There's a mix of, of sort of syntax in here. Many of these resources are just base level CloudFormation resources. If you're unfamiliar with SAM, it's called the serverless application model, and it's sort of a superset of CloudFormation. You can put it in the same template, uh, but in this case, the serverless function tries to automate some of the syntax you'd have to do by hand, like the execution role for the Lambda function and um, the event subscription, should that be necessary. So what you saw in here is that syntax, the SAM syntax that sort of references these things. And then when you go to deploy this, you're gonna get those underlying uh, IAM policy uh, and execution role. Does it ever generate SAM connectors or is that slightly different from here? It does not yet uh, work with SAM connectors. You can import those if you're using SAM connectors today. You can of course load a template that includes those and it's gonna be represented as a resource on the canvas. Uh, the overlap is real. So SAM connectors, if you're unfamiliar with those, these are IAC snippets in the serverless application model that let you say, I want to connect a source resource to a destination resource. And today it supports um, IAM connectivity. So I want to read, write, or read and write between two resources, which is kind of what you see me doing here. I want to create a, a relationship. In this case, it's a read and write via the S3 CRUD policy. A connector would be a clean fit here if you wanted to say, I want to connect this to that and only read. I'm, today, connectors don't yet support the event and environment data passing that Composer needs to do with these other functions. So we're working with that team to, yeah. to consolidate these over time and, and give you that choice if you want to use policy templates or connectors, but just create a default experience for you that, that makes sense. Uh, so we had a question there on how to integrate observability. That's an interesting yeah. one for me. I'm sorry, Julian, go ahead. Give me your thoughts on observability in this space. Because today this product supports X-Ray. <clears throat> and I'm, you know, I think there's a lot of custom tooling in this space that people want to integrate in their applications. I'm yeah. curious um, to hear people's feedback, but what's your take on, on how to, to work with those? Yeah, definitely. I think this is a two-part question. I don't think it's quite related to App, App Composer. Uh, thanks, Daruka Bandara, for joining us via YouTube. Having a hard time figuring out there are two options. And the first one is a future-proof and efficient solution to integrate custom observability platforms, uh, uh, Prometheus and Grafana. And then uh, is it using Lambda extensions and some external exporter? or just using embedded metrics with maybe Lambda Power Tools and then send, send directly to CloudWatch and then transfer uh, transfer to uh, Prometheus. That is a good one. And I I think you could use both. And I'm trying to work out in my head which would be preferred. I think Lambda extensions is going to be a good one if you if there is an extension that already exists and you are, it depends where you're sending it to. Is this another provider that is um, that uses a Prometheus or Grafana native um, observability format, because then you may as well use their extension to integrate because that's not code that you're gonna have to uh, manage and it's just going to do sort of do your observability before you. So that's gonna be a sort of less code um, that you need to look after. Um, but also then <clears throat> if you are using embedded metrics and if anybody out there is wondering, embedded metrics is one of the most awesome things in all of Lambda that probably not enough people know about. Embedded metrics is a JSON format that you basically dump metrics to your logs and then CloudWatch metrics automatically grabs those metrics out of your logs and you can populate uh, any custom metrics with CloudWatch. So it's literally a two for one. It's also an async process. So you're basically not paying that uh, additional invocation time to generate your metrics. So <clears throat> slight, a slight uh, tangent, but it is super useful to be able to create your, your metrics. And secondly, uh, Lambda Power Tools, if you're doing anything observability for any of your Lambda functions for uh, Python, .NET, uh, in GA, and Java, and TypeScript, Literary Power Tools is an awesome set of utilities for doing not just observability, but a whole bunch of other things from uh, feature flags for Python, for uh, sort of loading parameters, for doing API resource um, schema validation, all that kind of thing. So super useful for Power Tools. Um, so 
I'd be interested to hear from other people as well, because I think you could use both. I'm, I'm leaning towards extensions for when there's already an extension built and you're sending it to another observability partner. Um, but then maybe Power Tools, if you do have some more custom logic, because obviously you've got to then suck that data out of CloudWatch to transfer to Prometheus. So that involves another whole Lambda function and some sort of processing pipeline to do that. Um, so that's additional code and everything you need to look after, which is a bit more custom. So yeah, if there is a Lambda extension to do it, that's probably going to be a bit more, uh, probably going to be a bit, a bit more simple, simpler. Yeah, thank you. That I learned about embedded metrics just there. I, that's, embedded that's, metrics uh, format is awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I <clears throat> so I want to go on to show you one more thing. And if if you've joined late here, this is a browser only client. I have a read only IM role that I'm using to access this on the management console. There's no data being stored in my account. What we're doing here is designing what's going to be an infrastructure as a code template. You can bring in one of your own. Today it supports CloudFormation and SAM. Over time, we'll support others. You could start from scratch or you can you know, iterate on the template you brought in. And so the provisioning loop looks like bring in the template at whatever state it's in. So maybe you're coming in to add a new feature. Um, let me show you one that I didn't show you earlier. I'm, I'm gonna drop these resources and focus on an API gateway. Um, let's say I wanna have a function connected to a table and I'm gonna do some user storage here maybe. Um, so if that's my you know, feature that I'm adding to an existing architecture, maybe I already have an API, but one of the things I need to do is kind of set up an authorizer. Today we support Cognito for this. You could sort of wire up your own custom authorizer if you want. I'm in here, I can pull in a Cognito user pool and I can connect the authorizer to it. I can then bring in a user pool client and connect the function to it. I'm, and let's say, you know, I connect this route just for completeness and I arrange that. This sounds pretty sort of logical and reasonable and simple. The actual configuration for this is pretty gnarly, or at least it's it's verbose and complex. Uh, it looks like Julian. Uh, I was just thinking, I was like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that took me like a minute to do, and this may not be the complete. Oh, that was being overly easy. generous. Uh, only 20 seconds, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let alone yeah. a minute. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that's the thing about a composer. Yeah. It's it's not it's not automatic. So you have to now obviously work on your logic. Yeah. You have to express your Dynamo schema and like all the things you need to actually do. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the point is that it's taking you 20 seconds to get that the, all the stuff that's in your way out of your way so that you can go and focus on the things that you actually need to do to build this app. Um, so as I scroll through here, you can see things like the Dynamo CRUD policy is labeled in just like that S3 example I offered earlier. The events are triggered so that this Lambda will get invoked when that get method is called. The table is in here. The user pool is in here with some default configuration, some default alias attributes. It's referencing the user pool already. And the user pool client is in there and has been sort of granted access over here. Um, this environment da uh, data is shared so that that user pool can be referenced and used by the AWS SDK within your Lambda function. And so that okay. would have scaffolded the handler of the Lambda function and the environment variables. It, it scaffolds the environment variables. Today, okay. this Lambda function, <laughs> the scaffolding does not go further once yeah. you start to wire up new resources. That's a natural place for our roadmap, but that's today, okay. it's just I a thought, generic yeah. scaffolding. So I thought there was another handler that popped up, uh, another Lambda function that was created earlier, which did have a handler. Did have a handler. It didn't have anything else, which which would make sense. You don't know what's going to go in the function yet. I think that was our our demo mode sample. Okay. You yeah. can get like in demo mode, you can get a complete example that includes this kind of complexity. Um, but yeah, the the sort of standard experience for iterating the app will only sort of scaffold the basic yeah. function for you. But you can imagine us extending that over time because, yeah. as you're kind of alluding to. Composer has all the infrastructure details it needs to help you go further, like scaffold in your AWS SDK call to reference these environment variables, right? We, we have all that data. We could help you there. We haven't yet. And then the auth bit on the API. So this authorizers, this cognito pool, this integration to the function, these things, of course, you can do by hand. The point is you can bring your existing work into Composer, add in a route to your existing API, do this kind of scaffolding, and, you, and you're ready to go. You can go start working on it, start tweaking and customizing from there. Um, yeah, please, the questions are permitted. Um, yeah, just, um, just join yeah thanks for joining us. Back. Is that James Abraham? Um, I don't know if it is, but uh, his questions are certainly permitted. This is Serverless Office Hours Live. So um, yeah, please send, send us your questions. Um, if you are going to ask us any uh, strange things about, um, you know, sporting results in somewhere across the world or some trivial pursuit question, um, then we may not know, but otherwise, give us a try. 
Yeah, and while we're uh, accepting questions there, I'm, I can go in and add new uh, features for anyone who's added later or wants to kind of talk about roadmap. We don't yet have a public roadmap, but our team reads every single thing. You'll find the feedback link at the bottom of the console. You'll find a feedback link uh, when you search for a resource we don't yet support. We read every one of these. That's kind of the best stand in today for public roadmap. I know it, it takes some sort of effort to come in in here, but you don't even have to share your email. You can just share your thoughts anonymously with us. Um, if you choose to leave us an email, we're happy to follow up with you, learn more, uh, or notify you as features come out. That's, that's up to you. Um, really just we want to hear what you care about doing next in Composer and whether the experience has been useful for you uh, in, in kind of accomplishing the promise that I'm stating here, where you can quickly um, build out a new uh, design part of your architecture, um, start grouping that, organizing that into sort of your user pool. Right, that kind of stuff. Yeah, the goal here is to help you really quickly get going there so you can focus on, okay, how do I use Kinesis? I wanna go you know, connect a function to it. Okay, after I bring in this stream, I'm gonna go out to another function that's gonna chunk that file down. I'm great, that's done for you now. Like you can go start working on how do you actually use Kinesis because the infrastructure is provisioned and ready for you. Well, you have to go and provision it, um, but a tool like Samsung will make that simple for you. Okay, so what, what would the resource for Kinesis look like? Is that sort of a stub resource? Uh, and then obviously anything on the event source mapping, you can then go and add that configuration later. That's right. It's it's sort of a basic example to get you up and going. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. It's probably near the bottom. Oh, but yeah, nice. helpfully the permissions as well. That's also the kind of thing that... Yeah. Well, so in this case, it's the stream, the stream encryption uh, and sort of default. KMS key, you'll have to bring yeah. in your own KMS setup if you're using that. Uh, it, it switches the stream mode on demand by default. And I believe that function, what did I name it? Function two and three, those should have the permissions necessary to read and write to the stream. Uh, so there's function two, it has the environment variable for the stream in it. And then as I mentioned, the Kinesis CRUD policy. So in this case, it's actually a little bit more permissive. It's a read and write from the stream going in and probably on the way out as well. Yeah, because I mean, um, also like it's just the event source mapping on the back. Yeah, because <clears throat> I mean, things like SQS, for example, you can't actually ever just read. Well, you can't, you shouldn't really ever just read from the SQS queue because you need to go and delete the items in the SQS queue. So you know, uh, some people do get caught up with those kind of permissions, and this is also a a way to look at that, look and understand the sensible defaults. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can always trim down from here as your application needs, but you're going to get same defaults. They're going to be resource scope by default, and they're going to get you out of sort of confusion like that SQS policy uh, challenge where you, where you really do need read and write. I'm just going to grab the, the question. Uh, James, you are a novice. You've built an extension. I don't know if that's a Lambda extension or not. Uh, that pulls a piece of data that I uploaded to S3 bucket. I want to be able to streamline that without having to upload a text file to buckets. Not quite sure what you are asking, but if you are connecting S3 to Lambda directly, uh, the S3 uh, when a, when you do, you will have to manually upload a, something to S3, but that should automatically trigger a Lambda function. That Lambda function um, event payload contains the location of the S3 file, and you can then go and grab that in your Lambda function and do whatever you need. That's probably the most simpler way to do it. But yeah, send us uh, send us any more. Um, uh, clarification. Oh, is this a Chrome extension? Ah, okay. Uh, I don't <clears throat> actually know. I think that's a, a bit beyond the realms of what we're talking about here today. Um, I would suggest maybe speaking to front, some front-end people to find out how, um, how you um, basically going to be doing that. But thanks for the question. I, let's let's cover the. Uh, can you copy this into AWS CloudFormation Designer? Yeah, I'm. So these tools operate sort of at a different scope in my mind. So CloudFormation Designer will help you sort of reference all available CloudFormation types. You can drag those in, but then it doesn't give you any deployable content. You have to go and fill in all the properties you want. So you can paste in a template there and visualize it. That's great. But in terms of the build experience, it's really just scaffolding. You have to go and fill in. Composer has sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. There's obviously a limit to the resources you can build with, but those that we do support fully works. You can just drag them in as you've seen. You can integrate them to other services and deploy. I'm, now, both tools will let you visualize. So you can choose which visualization experience you like. This one um, looks like this. CloudFormation Designer has a bit sort of smaller, looks more like an architectural diagram you might build in Visio. That's up to your preference in terms of the visualization capability. This one will visualize any CloudFormation resource 
those that can be edited will show up like this and you can go on and extend your existing templates and then take them away and you don't have to come back to Composer until you want to. And you can continue to work on your CloudFormation template in the tool of your choice. Cool. Yeah, just circling around to, is that James Adams? I thought I could make an API from Lambda. You absolutely can make an API from Lambda. You can stick an API gateway in front of it, or can you, you can use the function uh, function URLs. I'm about to, I will send a link shortly to something called serverless patterns, which uh, Ryan has been has talked about uh, as, as well. And uh, so, yeah, that'll also give you a lot of starting places uh, to talk about. Just quickly before we are running out of time, but Hamza, to analyze the cost of serverless applications, any third-party tools we can use? I don't actually know of any third-party tools offhand. With AWS, there is the Cost Explorer. One of the big benefits of serverless applications is because they do entirely, mostly scale by cost up and down. Uh, you know, literally, you're within the Lambda function, for example, or a step function state transition. You know e exactly uh, every single state transition that is going to do. Um, so, yeah, serverless is great for actually modeling and analyzing the cost of your serverless applications. Um, I don't uh, offhand know a third-party tool. It's something I will look at, and I will suggest uh, uh, another time. There was one other question just about courses and certifications. Can you suggest some courses? There are plenty of uh, 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 courses to do, places like uh, Pluralsight, places like A Cloud Guru, and that's also not including the AWS courses, which there are plenty of ones. And how effective is AWS certificates for getting a cloud-related jobs? I'm sure any certificate would certainly help. I know the AWS, uh, I've done one of the uh, certifications, um, and it's certainly worth doing them uh, to help out. So, yeah, uh, we do have one or two questions. Um, I think not quite related to, um, so, yeah, I'm going to need to wrap it up over there. Ryan, any last minute things, any sort of uh, things you've just thought about that you're, you're missing and want to talk about? No, just to recap, um, this tool is in preview, but it's totally a browser client. You can bring in a template. You can start from scratch. I encourage you to go and try it. It doesn't interact with your AWS account at all. So you can come in, play, um, take the changes it makes or not, uh, up to you. And please leave us feedback. Uh, and, and I know Julian's going to drop a link to the AWS page where you can find out more. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, yeah, just before we do wrap up, uh, next week we've got we're talking multi-tenant serverless SaaS apps. We've got uh, Anton and Todd joining us. So yeah, so if you are wanting to do multi-tenanty kind of things in SaaS, uh, next week is going to be super interesting. The serverless patterns collection. This is what I was referring to. Infrastructure as code templates. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds over there. You could just copy them, dump them straight into um, application compose and visualize all of these things. Really great way to get started. So if you're wanting to see how all these integrations are done. It is an amazing resource. And there's also one for step, flow, uh, step functions, workflows, and also snippets, which are cool little, um, cool little tools for uh, integrating things and some CloudWatch logs insights uh, utilities. And this is all hosted on serverlessland.com. Uh, everything to do with serverless. Uh, yeah, the, one of the best places you can find about serverless is with a whole new getting started, uh, building event-driven architecture. So if you're wondering what that's all about, that is the place uh, to talk. So thank you so much for joining us, Ryan. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, until next time, and thanks so much for the questions and the comments, and we will see you same